The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Sami Shah. This is Ear to Asia. I think it's important for the Philippines to hold its ground. It's important for the Philippines to remind China that it's plucky, that it may be a smaller country compared to China, but this is a country of more than 100 million people. It has a GDP of half a trillion dollars. It's the fastest growing economy in the region. It has not only a treaty alliance with the U.S., but a whole series of networks of partnership. So the Philippines can put up a fight, and I think that's exactly what we're doing right now. In this episode... Can the Philippines stand up to China as maritime tensions mount? Air to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. Escalating maritime tensions between China and the Philippines have garnered significant international attention, with China's increasingly aggressive actions within the Philippines' Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, making the headlines all too regularly. No longer limiting their actions to the use of water cannons and laser beams against Philippine Navy personnel, the China Coast Guard has recently further upped the ante by ramming Philippine naval vessels in disputed waters. No surprise then that Philippine President Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. and his administration are coming under mounting pressure to defend the country's maritime territory against a far more powerful adversary. Despite varied approaches from past Philippine presidents to address China's maritime incursions, none have proven effective, and China's push to occupy maritime territory, contrary to international law, remains unabated. And although the United States is an ally of the Philippines through the 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty, this security relationship has not curbed China's belligerence, leading Filipinos to question the dependability of the US as a security partner. So, how can and should the Philippines defend its maritime territory against a formidable adversary? Can the United States be relied upon to contribute to reducing tensions in the South China Sea? And what role can ASEAN and the international community play in resolving maritime disputes of this nature? Joining me to explore the complex and intertwined relationships between the Philippines, China and the United States is Richard Hedarian, a widely published columnist, policy advisor and researcher specializing in international relations and Philippine politics at the Asia Center at the University of the Philippines. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Richard. My pleasure, Sammy. Richard, can we begin then with the pattern of escalation of China's maritime behaviors in the Philippines' exclusive economic zone? Well, the disputes between the two countries goes, you know, we're talking about decades here. It really took off as far as the two countries are concerned in the mid-1990s when China took over unilaterally the mischief reef, which falls within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, but also falls within China's so-called nine-dash line. But things really took a turn for the worse in 2012 when there were you know, really a months-long naval standoff between the Philippines and China. And eventually China managed to negotiate a mutual disengagement agreement. But as soon as the Philippines pulled out its warship in 2012 in order to de-escalate tensions, China sent a new armada and eventually uh, exercised effective control of another feature, the second Thomas Shoal, which also falls within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. Over the next decade, China has expanded its presence in the area through the construction of artificial islands and a whole complex of military facilities, which have become increasingly threatening to the Philippines. Now, in that period, I'm sure we'll discuss this later on more, you know, you had different Philippine administrations having different approaches. But what is consistent is that China keeps on expanding and fortifying its position on the ground, almost regardless of who is in charge in the Philippines. Under the current president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has taken a much more strident and assertive stance than his more pro-Beijing predecessor, Mr. Rodrigo Duterte. Tensions have been high again, uh, and what has happened over the past year alone is half a dozen incidents whereby there have been collisions and near clashes between Philippine and Chinese maritime forces, and at least in one case, several Filipino uh, naval servicemen were injured, one lost a finger, And there were multiple times when 
much larger and more sophisticated Chinese vessels ram into their Filipino counterparts and that created damages to the Philippines' relatively limited pool of patrol vessels and resupply vessels. Uh, so we're looking at a pretty dangerous situation, which could also draw in, obviously, bigger powers like the United States, which has a mutual defense treaty with the Philippines. So you mentioned uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr.'s administration's mood towards this and how there is an increasing anger and frustration. What about on the streets in the Philippines itself? Well, if you look at the surveys, especially the Pew survey, but all sorts of different surveys, including authoritative surveys in the Philippines, like social weather stations, Pulse Asia, this is clearly one of the regional outliers. When I say regional outlier, I'm talking about ASEAN regions. So if you look at Pew survey in, let's say, neighboring Malaysia or Indonesia, perspectives of China tend to be much more positive. The same thing in Thailand, which I think in theory is some sort of a U.S. treaty ally. Philippines and to a certain degree also Vietnam are the two regional outliers whereby the vast majority of the population has a very, very negative view of China. And some of the surveys in the Philippines show that more than 90% of the population wants the country to take a tougher stance. And more than 70% of the population wants the country to team up with not only the United States, but also other like-minded countries like Japan or Australia in order to better protect its interests. So as far as China's soft power is going, it's not doing a very good job in the Philippines. What do we know about these ship ramming events? Are they orders from on high in Beijing or are these the decisions of local enthusiastic, over enthusiastic, perhaps naval commanders? Perhaps you can say it's a combination of both, right? So I think from what we know, it was during the Hu Jintao administration in the late 2000s where, you know, you had really serious questions as to whether the people back in Zhongnanghai were calling the shots or whether it was a bunch of, you know, overzealous folks on the ground. But I think since President Xi Jinping has fully consolidated power, perhaps more than anyone since Mao Zedong, there are no questions about who's really calling the shots in China. But I think when it comes to operational details, tactical decisions, there's a certain degree of decentralization. So it's about broad coordinates set by folks in Beijing where they're going to say, we have to show force, we have to show us the boss. But in terms of tactical operational details, obviously that is being left to commanders on the ground, right? That is our understanding in the Philippines. Let's zero in then on one contested bit of geography, the second Thomas Shoal. What's the significance of this maritime feature to the Philippines and to China both? So obviously we're talking about dozens and dozens of land features being contested in the area. The Malaysian have less than half a dozen. The Filipinos have between eight to nine, depending on how you want to count who controls what. China similarly, and then of course the Vietnamese more than 20 land features, and I'm just talking about the Spratly group of islands. Of course, there's a parcel group of islands, there's a Pratas group of islands. So I'm just giving people the lay of the land. You know, we're talking about land features here, not islands, because based on United Nations Convention Law of the Sea, an island is a land feature that can actually sustain life on its own, meaning it has source of water, there are enough resources there. Per the ruling of the, you know, I'm talking about the arbitration case of 2016 by a body under the UNCLOS, Article 287, Adding 7, there is no island there. So we're talking about either rocks or low tide elevation. The second Thomas Shoal is a low tide elevation. So technically speaking, it's not even a territory. It's not even a rock. Forget about an island to be claimed. And it falls within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. Therefore, the Philippines claims it as an extension of its continental shelf very much part of its own exclusive economic zone. So it's not a territory to be claimed. But for China, it represents an island. And China, which has, of course, rejected the arbitration case of 2016, counts it as part of a whole body of land features within its own so-called nine-dash line based on its so-called historic rights claims in the area, supposedly going you know hundreds of years into the age, in, more ancient era. Now, this particular feature is interesting. So while like I mentioned to you, tensions between the Philippines and China can be really traced back to the mid-1990s when China took over the mischief reef, which is also within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. The lesson the Philippines learned from that is this. If you do not have folks on the ground, you don't have any kind of concrete, tangible presence on the ground, next thing you know, Chinese fishermen are going to show up. Next thing you know, Chinese military personnel are going to show up, supposedly protecting those fishermen. Next thing you know, you're going to have... China essentially colonizing or taking over that island and then later on making it a giant 
military facility as we see in Firecross and a whole host of different features over the past decade. So in its ultimate wisdom, one of the Filipino presidents, Erap Estrada, Joseph Estrada, his idea was, you know, very much a gritty one, right? Uh, he just said, let's just ram in an old World War II era warship into the area. And that effectively became the Philippines' de facto naval base there. So the Philippines has a military facility effectively in the second Tomasol over the BRP Sherry Madre. This is that old, now, you know, rusty, dilapidated ship, which has been parked by the Philippines since the late 1990s. So for almost quarter of a century, the Philippines has a de facto military base. Why is that important? Because the moment you have a military base by the Philippines there, then the American equation becomes very clear. Because the United States, especially under the Trump and the Biden administration, has made it clear that any attack on Filipino public vessels, especially military vessels, personnel or aircraft, would automatically trigger the Mitchell Defense Treaty. So what China is trying to do is not obviously to shoot at those personnel. That's why China is using so-called gray zone tactics, swarming, ramming, and besieging. So the Chinese since 2013, essentially for the past decade, have been trying to surround and swarm the Filipino facilities there so that the personnel cannot be resupplied, either by humanitarian goods or by construction facilities to fortify the dilapidated and until recently, what many thought a collapsing facility, which is the BRP Sherry Madre. And that's why it's very important. Of course, strategically is also important because it's essentially the gateway from the Spratly group of islands to Palawan, which is the Philippines' westernmost province. So this does cover some of the Philippines' motivations over contesting these regions. Why is China ratcheting up these tactics? What is the end game here? Well, China has a mixture of motivations. Of course, as a great power, it feels entitled to have some sort of a sphere of influence. And more importantly, because, you know, for China, they're not looking at the Philippines or some of the smaller neighboring countries per se as a threat. They see them as extension of a bigger threat, and that is the United States. So for them, the Philippines is an American dagger pointing at them. After all, the Philippines is a U.S. treaty ally. It has been hosting different kinds of American military presence in the past permanent military bases, and more recently, rotational American military presence. So for China, from a military standpoint, it wants to dominate the South China Sea as a kind of a perimeter of defense, as a strategic cushion, but also in order to make it easier for China if it wants to move into kinetic action vis-a-vis Taiwan, because the South China Sea also embraces Taiwan. So they're very brutal, you could even say imperial or hegemonic, military logic to this. But there are also more mundane factors at hand. So for a while, there were concerns whether a lot of aggressive activities by China, especially during the Hu Jintao administration, were driven by the interests of local government units. And of course, militia forces and Coast Guard forces stationed in those areas. So I'm talking about southern Chinese provinces, which have a huge appetite for fishery resources. From our understanding, there have been a lot of overfishing and overexploitation within China's exclusive economic zone. So you see more and more and bigger and bigger Chinese fishing vessels roaming the area. And this is an extremely resource-rich area. There's also the element of energy resources. And there is a huge speculation, or at least some of the preliminary studies by the International Energy Information of America, among others, has shown that some of the areas, in particular the Reed Bank area, which is not too far from the second Thomas Shoal, and the Palawan area of the Philippines, could be home to huge reserves of oil and gas. And the Philippines has been trying to develop that, but it cannot because all of the oil explorers in the areas are intimidated by China. So it's really a mixture of multiple factors. And then, of course, there's the ideological element, right? So after the Tiananmen massacre, it was very clear to the Chinese leadership that communism was no longer the glue that could bind the country. So they introduced patriotic education program, a kind of a populist nationalist program whereby ordinary Chinese citizens and future diplomats and officials who are now in positions of power back then just children or, or you know coming of age, they were made to believe that really the South China Sea is, as some would put it, their blue national soil. So there's also that sense of ideological commitment and a sense of China as a rising power reclaiming lost territory, in short, revanchism. 
How successful have the recent maritime tactics been in threatening or frightening the Philippines away from some of the areas China is interested in then? First of all, there's the element of demonstration effect, right? So the Philippines is not the only country having back and forth with China. We can talk about Vietnam, which has had even more back and forth with China and more brutal back and forth with China. Uh, In 1988, there was a skirmish between the Vietnamese and the Chinese and dozens of Vietnamese were injured or killed over the Johnson South Reef and other land features, disputed land features in the Spratly group of islands in the southern portion of the South China Sea. And over the past 20 years, the Vietnamese and Chinese have been going at it and have had their own near collisions and ramming and similar incidents. So so the Philippines obviously is not alone. It's also watching some of its neighboring countries engaging in their own, you know, resistance. Let's just put it that way, or jujitsu. Uh, the Malaysians, obviously the rhetoric always suggests they're the best friend of China and that they're critical of the West. But in reality, Malaysians also have been playing their cards quite carefully and sometimes more assertive than people appreciate. So for instance, during the pandemic, Malaysia from 2019 to 2020, unilaterally pushed ahead with exploration of oil and gas resources within its own exclusive economic zone, despite counter maneuvers and aggressive counter maneuvers by China. And then interestingly, also Indonesia. It is not a claimant state in the South China Sea, but because China's nine dust line is so vaguely defined, it actually pierces into the Natuna Sea area. So Indonesia renamed that area as North Natuna Sea. And just a few years ago, President Joko, if Indonesia went to the area, essentially, you know, planted the flag and said, you know, we're not going to make any compromise here. And Indonesia scrambled F-16 fighters and expanded its naval and military presence in the area. So it's not like we're the only, you know, David versus the Chinese Goliath. There are all sorts of different countries playing their own versions of David. But what makes the Philippines different is, of course, it's a U.S. treaty ally. And more importantly, it's the only country that is dared to take China to international courts. So in 2030, and after we lost the Scarborough Shoal, that's why I mentioned that milestone, the Philippines felt compelled to take the issue to the next level. And it eventually won that case. China obviously has refused to acknowledge the result of that ruling by an arbitration body under the aegis of UNCLOS. But the reality is that China was very worried because that could have set the precedence for Vietnam and other countries to also file kind of like a class suit-like kind of approach, take an approach like that uh, against China. So China was very aggressive to the Philippines between 2013 and 2016 while this arbitration case was going on. And then came Rodrigo Duterte, who suddenly out of nowhere adopted a radically different approach. And his approach was this, if I play nice to China, they're going to be nice to me. In fact, to be almost verbatim, he said, if you are meek, Use that word. If you're meek and humble, China will be merciful to you. That's essentially what Duterte said. In fact, almost verbatim. And for years, until the pandemic era, Duterte tried to play down the disputes. He even played down the Philippines' own arbitration case. And to China's delight and relish, he took on the United States. He costed Obama. He threatened to sever the Philippines' relations with the U.S., as the U.S. ramp up its own criticism of Duterte's war on drugs and human rights record. So those were those were golden halcyon years for China uh, as far as the relations with the Philippines is concerned. But in fairness, President Duterte by 2020, 2021 was recalibrating. So by 2021, the Philippines was already rebuilding its defense relationship with the United States and, and trying to fix some of the fault lines that emerged, including the earlier threat by Duterte to end the visiting forces agreement with the United States that allows tens of thousands of American troops to rotate through and to conduct exercises in the Philippines. So it's not like President Marcos Jr. just, you know, woke up one day and said, no, I want to be more assertive to China. No, former President Duterte, despite all his anti-American antics and his pro-Beijing and even pro-Putin predilections, eventually realized that the status quo was unsustainable, that, you know, he had to do something. So by 2021, even Duterte, during an ASEAN-China summit in October of 2021, openly criticized China, and Xi Jinping was in that meeting. So the Philippines has been already recalibrating since 2021, but I think the difference with Marcus Jr. is A, the rhetoric is much more explicit in a sense that we are not going to give in a single inch. We are going to assert the arbitration case. That's a big difference from Duterte. But more importantly, since last year, the Philippines has opened up new facilities to the Americans under the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, the very agreement that Duterte tried to slip on and tried to drag his foot on 
Now you have a new administration saying, no, in order for China to respect us, we have to strengthen our military relationship with the United States. And that's where I think that's why China is very, very picked and why the Chinese are reacting in such an aggressive way, because their worry is eventually the Philippines will not only bring in more Americans to protect them in the South China Sea or help them in the South China Sea, but also for Americans to have more presence close to Taiwan, because northern portions of the Philippines, where I am right now, is less than an hour flight away from Taipei. In fact, it's just 40 minutes or so from where I am right now to Kaohsiung in southern Taiwan. So now the Philippines is at the center of this great power rivalry, just as it tries to protect its own patrimony and sovereign rights. Within that rivalry, though, there's also the awkward tension of the Philippines' economic relationship with China. What aspects and how much of the Philippines' economy is China dependent right now? Again, that's where the Philippines is quite an outlier, right? So I think a lot has been said about, you know, China, ASEAN trade. And if you look at it recently, Indonesia imposed tariffs on China. That trade is very asymmetrical. Back in the day, you know, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, a lot of us were light manufacturing powerhouses. We were called the tiger cub economies, right? Whether it's Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia. But over the past quarter of a century, all of that manufacturing moved to China. So a lot of us became really more of resource extraction economies. We became more like Latin American economies rather than the Taiwans and South Koreas of this world. So to a certain degree, the rise of China has also meant a certain degree of the industrialization in Southeast Asia. And you have a situation whereby much of exports of Malaysia, and Indonesia, and Philippines to China is really just, you know, mineral resources, right? Or, you know, extractive resources. So what we're seeing right now is that trade is expanding, but it's very asymmetrical. And the terms of trade are not very favorable to a lot of ASEAN countries who want to also industrialize and push up the ladder, uh, the value chain. So you see those tensions building up. But in the case of the Philippines, actually, compared to a lot of our neighboring countries, especially Vietnam, you know, which also has a quite a strident stance in the South China Sea, we have a much more diversified portfolio. Compared to those countries, actually, Japan and the United States are far more important to us. Europe is very important to us. So we have a lot of trade with China, but it's a very asymmetrical trade. It's a huge trade imbalance. China gains far more from their export to us than us to China. We face a lot of barriers. We face a lot of problems in terms of investing in China, especially in critical sectors. That's the complaint of our big companies. And at the same time, you know, China promised a lot of investments during the Duterte administration. And none of that was really fulfilled. And that's why I say the term that we should use is not debt trap, meaning China, you know, just pouring debt into a country X and, and you know, with high interest rates, essentially enslaving that country, fiscally speaking, as allegedly happened in Sri Lanka and allegedly could happen in Pakistan or allegedly was the case in Malaysia, I think, but more realistically could be the case in Laos, for instance, or Tajikistan, based on the numbers and studies I'm looking at. Um, in the case of Philippines, none. We had pledge trap, you know, empty pledges by China. China promised $24 billion in investments when Rodrigo Duterte, the former Philippine president, visited Beijing in 2016. Last time I checked, barely a billion or two came in. And as far as big ticket belt and road initiative projects are concerned, show me. Show me the projects because I don't see any. The projects I see are Japanese projects. There's a major subway project in Metro Manila. Much of the massive expressway projects here are in tandem with the, with the Japanese. The Philippines is building new massive modern airports. The Germans are involved. The Dutch are involved. The South Koreans are involved. The Americans want to get involved, but I don't see much of China. So we see a lot of empty pledges, but not much of infrastructure investment portfolio, big ticket infrastructure investment portfolio by China. What we have are some symbolic projects that I actually visited the other week. There's this China-Philippines friendship project in the Philippine Chinatown uh, in Bidondo. I visited Nothing really spectacular. And in fact, the joke in the Philippines is that these projects were better for China than the Philippines because the contractor, the technology, the workers, everything was from China anyway. And in fact, some people even ask questions about the necessity of those projects, whether they were really fiscally sound and sustainable. But, you know, I don't want to take that away from China. They might say I'm a China hater. Thank you for that little bridge or two you have built here. But as far as I'm concerned, there's no BRI. There's no big ticket infrastructure projects. We only had pledge trap, empty pledges in exchange for geopolitical subservience under former President Duterte, something that was not sustainable, hence his recalibration by 2021. 
You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Air to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Air to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Sami Shah, and I'm joined by global columnist and international relations researcher Richard Hedarian from the University of the Philippines. We're talking about how growing maritime tensions off the Philippines' coast has impacted relations with China and the United States. The ethnic Chinese community has been regarded as being well integrated into Filipino society. How has the escalation of China's maritime belligerence affected how Chinese Filipinos are perceived by ordinary Filipinos? Interesting. I keep on saying the Philippines is an outlier. In fact, probably I'll write a book one day about Philippine exceptionalism, right? Uh, and speaking of exceptionalism, you know, if you look at archipelagic Southeast Asia, with the obvious exception of Singapore, which is Chinese majority, I think the Chinese minority has been extremely well integrated into the fabric of the not only Philippine society, but Philippine political elite. You know, you, you can find cultural elite uh, folks of Chinese descent, let's say in Indonesia, but a lot of them had to change their name, right? In the Philippines, we have countless folks who actually have, you know, even sometimes complete Chinese name or partially Chinese name, meaning they didn't fully Christianize their names, who are massive celebrities, cultural icons in the Philippines. We have Chinese Filipino or Filipinos of Chinese descent folks, second generation even or so, not too far removed, you know, um, uh, who are at very senior levels of government. In the Senate, for instance, in the Philippine Senate, we have at least two individuals, two senators who are, you know, ethnically Chinese, right? And, you know, their ancestors came here not long ago. So I don't think when it comes to culture and politics, and of course, especially economics, there has been any issue of structural exclusion. If anything, the Filipino Chinese community is a very privileged elite and very well integrated community. Now, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, cultural prejudices here and that once in a while there's some you know backlash online but we don't have any history of pogroms anti-chinese minority pogroms in the philippines in modern times so you have to go all the way back to the 17th century during the spanish era when they were doing their own you know inquisition fidelistic style kind of governance to see any kind of pogrom so that's one of the things we're very proud of our multicultural pluralistic society with almost no precedence of pogroms against the Chinese minorities. Having said that, of course, the situation is quite difficult because some of the richest people in the Philippines, like for instance, the C family who own the uh, Schumart SM chain of malls, these are multi-billions. I mean, we're talking about a net worth of more than $10 billion as far as this family is concerned. Much of those products in those malls are from China, including from their ancestral province back in China. And in fact, one of those siblings, the C siblings, their father started the whole business. Not long ago, in an interview on Bloomberg, came out and said something about, she was obviously very careful about what she said, but she was implying that if the Philippines take a more assertive stance and team up with the US, that's going to have negative repercussions for business. Now, she couched it in a quite a neutral language, but nevertheless, it was not received well. So the backlash was immense. And, you know, online, I saw many netizens engaging in almost semi-racialist argument that like, oh, of course you guys are not really Filipinos. Oh, of course you guys, your loyalty is either to money or your ancestral home, etc. And so after that, we saw that some of these Chinese Filipino business folks really had to reconsider making public statements. There was another Chinese Filipino business group who also made a statement about trade being affected and all. It didn't make much traction and there wasn't much of a response. So I think there's almost a... I don't want to use the term bipartisan consensus because, you know, we don't have really a party system like the United States. But there's almost kind of a consensus among much of the section of elite that uh, we have to be assertive towards China and we have to fortify our relationship with the United States. The only exception are the Dutertes, who are interestingly now positioning themselves as the opposition, even if they were part of a so-called unity team with Marcos Jr. when Marcos Jr. ran for presidency in 2022. Chinese media describes recent incidents as excuses to normalize U.S. military presence in the region. 
but the United States has had a decades-long military presence in the Philippines. Can you give us a short summary of the U.S.-Philippines security relationship? Let's call it spade a spade. The Philippines was an American colony. In fact, it was the only American colony in Asia. I mean, the Americans always talk about their special relationship, the Commonwealth era, but no, we were colonized. The Philippines was the site of first anti-colonial nationalist revolt in entire Asia. We're talking about late 19th century. This is Jose Rizal, Bonifacio, the so-called Ilustrados, a lot of them educated in Madre España. And next thing they wanted is to follow in the footsteps of other former Spanish colonies and create their own independent state. And then the Americans come in in the guise of helping the Philippines. And the next thing you know, they not only hijack our revolution, they colonize our country. And in fact, there was a brutal war in the early 20th century that caused the death of some would say hundreds of thousands of Filipinos. And so many would even trace the rise of the American empire from its colonization of the Philippines. But that's also the root of the bilateral alliance. So even if the Philippines eventually became an independent country, at least nominally towards the end of Second World War, when much of Manila, once the Pearl of Asia, was devastated by American bombings against the Japanese colonizers, the Americans gave the independence to the Philippines, but interestingly, in many ways, the Philippines was a new colony of the United States. The United States enjoyed special economic privileges whereby an American businessman could almost enjoy the same rights as a Filipino businessman in the Philippines. American companies and American individuals dominated key sectors of the economy, including the media sector. So one of the biggest media networks in the Philippines, GMA Network, where I used to work, you know, was started by an American. But more importantly, the Philippines and America signed a series of agreements, including basing agreement and the mutual defense treaty agreement in the mid 20th century, which ensured that the Philippines effectively outsourced its external security needs to the United States. In the 50s and 60s, the Philippines, thanks to American military aid and equipment, had arguably the most advanced army and military in the region. But things really went downhill for the Philippines when the late Filipino dictator, Marcos Sr., the father of the current president, engaged in an aggressive maneuver. First, he wanted to take back Sabah, which, of course, is in Malaysia, but Philippines believes it belongs to the Philippines because, you know, via the Sultanate of Sulu, which is part of the Philippines. But that went already. Next thing you know, there is a complete civil war in Sounder Island of Mindanao, where there's a huge minority or at some point even majority of Muslim or Moro Filipino population. So for decades, the Philippines has been embroiled in an effective civil war in the South, and that meant degradation of the Philippines' military capability. And with that degradation, it had two effects. One is growing dependence on the United States for anything that had to do external security, and more and more investment in the Philippine army rather than its navy and air force, even if the Philippines is an archipelagic country, because it's the army that is waging the war in Mindanao, right, against Muslim rebels and also communist rebels, because that war created more devastation, more poverty, more social injustice, therefore more communist rebellion. So that vicious cycle went on and on and on for a very long time, arguably until recent years. And in that context, the Philippines had to rely on the United States again and again, Nevertheless, the Philippines has also been very useful to the United States because after the 9-11, the, the alliance very much focused on counterterrorism in the so-called global war and terror. So in that zeitgeist, the Americans and the Filipinos cooperated very much in counterterrorism, including against Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups in the Philippines. And that counterterrorism cooperation will extend all the way to 2017 when a Daesh or ISIS-affiliated group, Maute, almost took over a whole city, Marawi City, which is a Muslim-majority city in Mindanao, Southern Philippines. Nevertheless, all three administrations of Aquino, Duterte, and Marcos have rightly focused on developing the Philippines' naval and military capabilities. And in fact, we want to invest up to $35 billion over the next decade in that direction. But the problem is that you're up against China with the largest naval fleet, uh, a country that is building warships every other month or so and is acquiring its own aircraft carriers among many other military equipment. So in that situation, the Philippines inevitably has to rely on the United States in one way or another. Now, the U.S. for a very long time developed the so-called strategy of ambiguity or strategic ambiguity. And this goes back to Henry Kissinger and the Richard Nixon administration in the 1970s when, you know, as I said, back then the Philippines had the most advanced military, 
So we were actually the one at the forefront of building our presence in the Spratlys. And we built the first airstrip in the entire area in the Fito Island or what we call Pagasa or Hope Island. This is in the late 1970s. But the reality is that, of course, the Philippines is no longer at the edge of military capability. And now we're up against China. So the Philippines has consistently pushed the United States to be more helpful and more directly reassuring. But that did not happen until a few years ago under the Trump administration, when the Trump administration made it very clear publicly when Secretary Pompeo was in Manila in 2019, March 2019, he said any attack on Philippine public vessels, aircrafts, or personnel will automatically trigger the mutual defense treaty. And he mentioned the South China Sea in particular. He was not vague about geography or vague about the parameters as previous American administrations, including Obama was. Obama was in Manila in 2014, and he was point blank asked a question, will you help the Philippines if there's a war with China, let's say over Scarborough Shoal? And he went just this lawyerly, legalist, uh, you know, and he, in fact, he even uh, dismissed the Philippine claims as like, you know, we don't go to war over a bunch of rocks. He was very dismissive. So it was really with Trump and thanks to Biden administration, now we have a continuity that we see this very clear statements by the U.S. that an armed attack on Filipino personnel, military personnel, Navy personnel, Coast Guard personnel will trigger mutual defense treaty. But China is not using armed attack. China is using gray zone tactics, ramming, swarming, Right. And that is not covered by the Mutual Defense Treaty. So that's the big hole in the U.S.-Philippine alliance. So the challenge right now is how to tweak the alliance to cover gray zone threats from China, because China is getting away with not using arm attack, but anything else short of that. The world faces a real prospect of a second Trump term. How might that affect the Philippines-U.S. relationship? Well, I mean, there are many in the Philippines who are actually very optimistic about Trump. I think Philippines is one of the most pro-Trump countries out there. There are many Philippine Americans who vote for Trump, feel very strongly about Trump. There's a very strong constituency, Republican or Republican-leaning constituency among Filipinos, a lot of whom, of course, have family or are related to someone who's a citizen in America or resident of America. Now, so I think there's a lot of optimism, but I would say wishful thinking that Trump will be even better for the Philippines because he's supposed to be tougher and he's going to you know, go against China and he's going to bring a lot of hawkish folks into the fray. Uh, and in fairness, it was the Trump administration that imposed tariffs on the Chinese. It was the Trump administration which expanded its foreign military financing to the Philippines. But a more, I would say, realistic, if not skeptical point of view would say maybe the Philippines would be the you know, in the first class cabin in a sinking Titanic ship of American foreign policy if we get the more vengeful version of Trump, vengeful and erratic version of Trump. I have no question that you may get Elbridge Colby or Pottinger and some of these China hawks into positions of power if Trump too comes into fruition. But at the end of the day, it's the commander in chief who calls the shot. And with Trump, is a game of musical chair. He could fire anyone any day. And the fear, I would say, is maybe Trump will, you know, sleepwalk into conflict, let's say, with Iran in the Middle East. That's not an impossibility. And if America gets involved in a war in behalf of its ally Israel in the Middle East, good luck with being helpful to us in this part of the world. Not to mention the Europeans obviously have also their own tensions and problems if ever Trump comes to power. Nevertheless, the Philippines is trying to Trump-proof its alliance. I mean, Biden is also trying to Trump-proof the alliance. And accordingly, we're seeing all sorts of different projects by the quadrilateral security dialogue of India, Australia, Japan, and US. They want to do joint Coast Guard initiatives. I think those initiatives will be there regardless of who's in power next year. There is the trilateral Japan, Philippine, United States. I call it JAFOS so that it rhymes with AUKUS. There's also a lot of focus on military cooperation. The Japanese are signing a reciprocal access agreement with the Philippines. The Australians are expanding their security cooperation with the Philippines. The Kiwis, the French, the South Koreans, the Germans are looking at their own reciprocal access agreements with the Philippines. And of course, the Americans, this is a bipartisan bill, are pushing for at least $500 million, half a billion dollars of foreign military financing and aid annually over the next five years. So we're looking at several billion dollars of defense aid to the Philippines, almost regardless of who's in the White House. So it's going to be a mixed bag. I think even if we get a, the vengeful, erratic version of Trump, it's not ideal for the Philippines, but I think there's enough bipartisanship against China for the Philippines to get something out of it. But will that be enough to deter China and make it think twice? Oh, I think that's a debate. Well, then that does raise the question, what can and should the Philippines do in the face of a far more powerful adversary that is China? 
Yeah, um, you know, I have always this discussion with my Russian friends and Chinese friends. I mean, a lot of these are exiled people, obviously. And I say, like, I always see a big difference between Putin and Xi Jinping. They may be almost of exact age. They may be best pals and all of that. They're supposed to be part of an axis and calling for a new world order. But I think Xi Jinping is not Putin in a sense that China has far more to lose in a war. China is a winner of the current international order, at least economically speaking, And I think Xi Jinping is far more calculated and sophisticated strategic thinker than Putin. And if you're China, the last thing you want is to become a rogue state in your own supposed backyard. I think China is doing fantastic in terms of soft power when it comes to much of Southeast Asia. It's sounding the right notes on Gaza issue. It's weaponizing anti-Western sentiment across the so-called global South. So if you're China, actually time is on your side. Your economy is getting stronger. Your trade is expanding. Your investment portfolio is expanding. So picking a war is really not in his interest in ways that perhaps, at least in the twisted logic of Putin, was in Russia's interest in the case of Ukraine. So I'm not as worried about revanchism of China as some of our European friends are worried about, let's say, Russia's revanchism. But having said that, I think it's important for the Philippines to hold its ground. It's important for the Philippines to remind China that it's plucky, that it may be a smaller country compared to China, but this is a country of more than 100 million people. It has a GDP of half a trillion dollars. It's the fastest growing economy in the region. It has not only a treaty alliance with the U.S., but a whole series of networks of partnership. So the Philippines can put up a fight. And I think that's exactly what we're doing right now. Nevertheless, we have entered a dangerous new normal whereby this kind of aggressive gray zone tactics by China, I think, are going to be regular, are going to be worrying and perilous. But I think the Philippines has to hold its ground while also working international diplomacy, while also looking at the possibility of filing new arbitration cases against China, while also tweaking its alliance with the United States to make it more effective, not only against an all-out war situation, but also against China's gray zone tactics. And in the meantime, the Philippines should more rapidly build up its own naval capabilities. And I think some of our allies and friends can donate some of their newly retired warships, you know, patrol vessels. So I don't think the situation is as desperate for the Philippines. And remember, China is up against not one, but multiple claimant states here. So far, you know, Malaysia and the Vietnamese, once again, are piggy banking on us. They're essentially free riders because the Philippines is taking the punches, as just as how we did it when we filed the arbitration case and they never joined, but they leverage it for their own cause. But it's inevitable that those countries will also push back as China tries to also impose its will on those countries. So I think there's still a lot that the Philippines can do in terms of mini-lateral, not multilateral, because honestly... This is very undiplomatic, but ASEAN has been just short of useless when it comes to helping the Philippines in the South China in recent years. But key ASEAN countries can minilaterally cooperate with the Philippines. As we speak, we're cooperating with Vietnam to delimit our overlapping maritime borders in the South China Sea. We are looking at more Coast Guard activities, more intelligence sharing. We're quietly talking to our Malaysian friends to make sure when next year they take over ASEAN, they don't essentially tow the Chinese line. We were talking to the Indonesians. Prabowo was just in town with his new best friend, Marcus Jr. A lot of interesting things are happening. So I think the Philippines is not really out of options. And, you know, we're Filipinos. We love boxing. So if this were a boxing match, I think it's round four. China may have won round one, two, and three. But I think, I think the Philippines has done very well in round four. And we have more than a half a dozen rounds perhaps to go. There's no knockdown yet. Everyone is holding on to what they have so far. And no one is losing anything with the arguable exception of the Scarborough in 2012. So this is going to be a marathon. This is going to be a marathon. And I don't see we're going to see a denouement anytime soon unless something cataclysmic happens in China or China engages in something out of character in the coming years. Thank you very much, Richard Hedarian. My pleasure, Sammy. Our guest has been Richard Hedarian from the University of the Philippines. Air to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Air to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 25th of September 2024. Producers were Kelvin Param and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com.
Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons Copyright 2024, the University of Melbourne. I'm Sammy Shah. Thanks for your company. Thank you.